Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at Second Baptist Church. I'm glad you could be with me. Um, we're continuing in our study of Colossians. And this week, the title of the lesson or the topic of the lesson is Freedom in Christ. And so we're going to um, talk about some, some things about that. And we're, we're picking up right from where we left off last week. Uh, in Colossians chapter 2 in verse 16 and Paul it's talking you know to the Colossians this is a letter from Paul to them um, the Colossians were people that he had never met before but it was a new church that had been started and so Paul is trying to help to disciple them by the letter that he has written and so he just got done in last week's lesson talking about um, how Jesus canceled the debt against us or the lien against us, um, which was our sins, the debt of sin uh, when he died on the cross. And so he's just finished talking about how that triumph um, was a triumph over rulers and authorities and those in power and so he begins verse 16 by saying therefore so in other words because those things happened therefore this that we're about to read so now let's start by reading uh, verses 16 and 17 therefore no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a sabbath day things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So he's saying because your debt of sin has been canceled, no one, including those um, rulers of the Jews who may be wanting to impose um, laws and rules even on the new Christians, no one is, is supposed to do that. No one is to be your judge or to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or a festival, new moon or a Sabbath day. So there, there was, um, you know, in other places in the New Testament and in the writings of Paul, it's referred to that um, there were people who would buy food from that had been sacrificed to idols and eat that food, you know, because that was cheaper. So if people went to the to one of the temples and they sacrificed some food to an idol, then I think the temple was taking that food and turn around and, you know, you could buy it and eat it yourself. And they got money for the temple that way. It I'm talking about pagan temples, you know. And so... Uh, you know, some people then were saying, no, we, we should not eat food sacrificed to idols. And then, of course, the Gentiles that might have become Christians, they did not necessarily follow the strict Jewish uh, kosher rules for things you could eat or not eat. You know, they, they came into Christianity from a lifestyle where they ate probably uh, you know, all kinds of meat and not even including pork, maybe, or, you know, or things like that, you can imagine. And so all of those things then came into the mix when they came in uh, to the church. There may have been some that said, well, if they're going to come into the church, they have to do this, that, or the other thing to be like us. You know, they have to conform to our um, way of doing things. And so you know, those things were all in the mix. And then um, he, in the latter part of these two verses, he says that these things, like the food, the drink, and uh, festivals and different things, are a mere shadow of what is to come. And so, he, you know, what Paul is, is saying is that those things are, are minimal or not as important as what is to come. The substance of believing then 
is Jesus Christ. And that is really, that really should be our focus and not focus on these little nitpicky things. And, you know, we see this even today um, at times. And I guess maybe in a way we don't see it as often as we might because we don't have a lot of new believers coming in to our churches. But if new believers were flocking in as they were at this time, then they would be coming in with all sorts of um, clothing or lifestyles or whatever that they had been involved in before they became Christian. And God may be working some of those things out of them but he, like I said last week, you don't just snap and suddenly become discipled. And so they were dealing with all of these things. Okay, let's go on forward now to um, verses 18 and 19. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Okay, so he's also warning them not to let someone take away their belief or their salvation. They're, they're not take away their salvation, but they're the joy of their salvation by trying to add on to them self-abasement or the worship of angels now self-abasement is like um you know where you deny yourself something or humble yourself in some way to be pleasing more pleasing to god you know like that um and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment and then the worship of angels was apparently also a problem and it had tried to creep in to uh, the Christian community, I guess you might say. And then he talks about this person, you know, an anonymous person there, taking his stand on visions he has seen and inflated uh, without cause by his fleshly mind. So, you know, perhaps you can imagine um, some kind of, of a guy going around who was preaching but a lot of it you know was coming from up here where he had seen visions and he was enlightening everybody about the truth and I mean we have those people today for sure you know that that have a whole new insight into the book of the revelation or whatever you know you you can find those people around Waycross even um who are obsessed with having a better revelation or a better insight into the scriptures than everybody else. Um, and then uh, in verse 19, it says, Not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. So the head of the body the body being the body of believers or the church the head of the body is christ and then it says um that this this type of person is not holding fast to the head um from whom the entire body is supplied and held together and grows and so a person like that who's adding these other things is really taking away people from the body of Christ and to follow their own set of beliefs that they're coming up with. Now, in verses 20 and 21, it says, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. So Paul then is saying, you know, 
why if you have died when you died with Christ as in you were buried with Christ in baptism and you rose to the new life then why would you go back to the elementary principles of the world that put restrictions on you that say you know you must do this to please God or you must do that to please God that was the people that were living under the law and under the law there were so many things that you must or must not do um, to please God the Pharisees you know were a good example of the, all of those things and they just had just hundreds of little rules that they followed or tried to follow you know and, and to say that you're not pleasing to God unless you do all of these things and try to then put that on everybody else too and get everybody else to do that along with them and it you know it was ridiculous rules like um you know you couldn't you couldn't um, swat a fly, you know, on the Sabbath day and things like that. Or if, you know, you could only walk X number of distance on the Sabbath day and you could, you know, do nothing that was considered to be work. And that still happens today because we were just talking uh, with someone, I have to remember how I learned that but it was just recently um someone that lived in New York City and they lived in a Jewish community up in New York City and the the Jewish uh man that lived next door to them once the Sabbath arrived they could do nothing that appeared to be work and one of the things that they could not do was flip the light switch Okay, so if the man didn't make it home from work in time to flip off the light, um, then he would come over to the neighbor, the, the person who um, I heard this from. He would come over there. He could not talk to them because they were, you know, heathens. But through, through motions... He would get him to come over to his apartment and flip off the light for them because they could not do that. And so, there were again, there are all of these rules and restrictions that people are living by, and they're doing this to try and please God. But um, the rules have become the religion, I guess you might say, and they've forgotten about the head which is Jesus, and of course those guys never knew Jesus or have never followed Jesus, but they've even really lost God in the mix of all that, haven't they, um, with trying to follow all of their man-made rules. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat's getting dried out. So, I was thinking about this and I was remembering over in India, something that you see um, in around Easter time, you see it on the news a lot of times, is where people in India would be crawling on their hands and knees for miles to um, the temple or the church, you know, where they were going to. Um, celebrate Easter or maybe they were even being crucified and hung on a cross and doing that to show their loyalty to Christ and you know those kind of things are a way of self-abasement I guess you know to try to please God is what they're doing and in Matthew 23, 23 is that famous verse where it's where Jesus referred to straining at a gnat but swallowing a camel. You know, where the Pharisees, they would not, it, the little bitty thing, little tiniest imaginable thing like turning on the light switch, you weren't would not be allowed to do that. Of course, back then they didn't have electricity, but nowadays. But yet then... Uh, swallowing a camel, which, you know, in a way, 
I guess you might say that could be not believing in Jesus, not following the Messiah. And so they're willing to accept that the Messiah was not real, but yet they're going to impose all of these things on themselves. And so let's go ahead then and read verse 22. And he said, all of these things, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. So all of those little things like that that get imposed on people are all going to perish. Those will not stand the test of time They, when the judgment day happens and um, our works pass through the judgment of God. It says that our works will be burned up because the works that we do to make us deserve salvation are nothing. They're useless, pointless, and nothing. Um, and we can't in any way please God by doing those things or gain our salvation. I mean, we might please God. I guess maybe that's the wrong way to say that, but we cannot gain our salvation. We cannot please God in that way to say, oh, well, look at them. They've done so many good things. I have to let them into heaven. That's not um, the way it works. We must, um, we must please God by following Jesus. That's, that's the way that we really, really please God is by our faith and our, our belief and our following Jesus. And then last in uh, verse 23, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So, you know, he just kind of sums it up by saying that these things, you know, they seem to make sense sometimes. They, they are viewed as being wisdom um, by those who have a self-made religion or self-abasement, you know, are interested in self-abasement. And we have to be really careful with this because we do a lot of these things. I'm t pointing the finger at me now. We do a lot of these things without even thinking about it. And we, we uh, make it that this is the way it has to be to please God and do things properly. For example, let's just pick, pick on things a little bit. We sit on pews facing forward in the church and, you know, we all are in agreement that that's the way you do it when you come to church. You sit on pews facing forward. But um, what if someone came in and the most comfortable place they could sit would be to sit on the floor? What if they weren't used to sitting on pews? What if they came from a culture that mostly sat on the floor? And so they came in and instead of sitting on a pew, they went up near the piano where there's a space or something, and they just sat down on the floor to listen to the pastor. <laughs> Can you imagine? And everyone in the church would be looking, what's fixing to happen next, you know? Why is that person doing that? And it may just simply be that they don't, they don't know, they haven't realized that um, other people don't do that, you know. And, you know, there's a lot of things like that that we do because that's the way it's been done, you know, for a long time. And not necessarily, like, who was the first person that said, um, instead of meeting under a tree, let's build a building and we'll make these benches and we'll all sit in them facing forward and there'll be a pulpit in the middle in the front and we'll all face in that direction. I mean, a circle would kind of make more sense in a way, you know, then it would be more of a group or, you know, maybe some other configuration. So, you know, all of those things that we hold dear and we feel are essential to our Christian faith or our Christian walk, 
uh, we should reconsider those at times. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with sitting on pews, but um, we should consider why do we do these things? And is this really what it's all about? I guess you might say, because you can make it so that those things are what it's all about. You know, and that's, that's when you get a church that fights over the color of the carpet because they've forgotten what it's all about and they've begun to quibble over some trivial thing there. So we do have freedom in Christ. It's what Paul is saying in, the, in this section and maybe I didn't bring that out well enough, but we have freedom in Christ. We, we are not under the restrictions of men our sins have been paid for on at the same time and we'll talk about this more as we go forward but at the same time we're not free to um go crazy i mean are we you know that that also would not make sense to say oh well, i'm going to do every wrong thing because it doesn't matter anymore i'm free in christ now i can do anything that's not the meaning you know that's not the that's not what it means. You know, it's, it's, we do have freedom in Christ though. And we should allow others to have the freedom also. Because really and truly, you know, to, to look at a person and say, that person should stop smoking, for example. And we kind of look down on them because they haven't stopped smoking. And we think, you know, that make a judgment call about them because of that well you know to be honest that's not our call to make you know the holy spirit can work on that person now of course we want to encourage everyone to be as healthy as possible and we might would you know talk to them about it in that way of saying you know it can cause cancer or or whatever you know um consider consider trying to stop but not in the way of looking down on them and thinking, well, they're not a strong Christian because they smoke. Because that, that may just be the thing that God has not finished working on them. They might be much stronger than us in some other areas, in the area of love or sharing or whatever it is, you know. So we really, we can't make a judgment or put ourselves in the seat of judgment about people. And we have to remember that we have freedom, personal freedom. We should not put things on ourselves that God does not expect of us. Um, for a long time, when I was younger, I felt like if, if someone came along and they said, this is my ministry, I'm doing the, the children's church. And I think you ought to join me. I think you would be great at this. For a long, long time, I felt like, okay, I should do that because they want me to. And I know God would want me to be involved because um, it's a good thing. And I would get myself so involved in things that really God never... Um, intended for me to do I think <laughs> but I felt like I, I needed to do those to be a good Christian you know to be doing all the things that I should do that was what was expected of me by other people and it was a freedom for me when I came to a point of realizing that that was the expectations of other people that was not what God was expecting of me. And God has expectations of us, no doubt about it. You know, but what we need to do is we need to find out what are God's expectations of me. And when I finally had the freedom to say no to someone, to say what, what I feel God leading me in this direction, I don't feel God leading me in that direction of supporting your ministry, even though your ministry is a great ministry and much needed. When I was able to make that distinction and say no uh, to people based on my convictions, then I began to feel 
a real freedom in Christ and feel, you know, in my heart that um, I was following what, what Christ wanted me to do in my decisions that I made. And, that, you know, that was that was not easy, especially the first time I ever said no to someone. You know, I felt I felt so bad and so guilty. I mean, I really put myself on a guilt trip. But that was me putting myself on a guilt trip. That was not God putting me on a guilt trip. And I knew it. I knew that that I was just doing that to myself. But, um, you know, I, a lot of times we do that. We, we have expectations of ourselves. What are the women of the church supposed to be doing? And if we're not doing all of those things, then we must not be a, a good church member. Or what are the men supposed to be doing? All that the men should be involved in. And why, you know, why is my husband not doing all the things that I think he should do? You know, and stuff like that. It's very easy to go down that, that route. But really and truly, as it said there at the beginning, the substance of everything, everything else is just a shadow of things to come. The substance is Christ and our relationship with Him and how we share that relationship with other people so that they can come in to the body of Christ and have that relationship. That's what's most important. So... Anyway, we'll end it there, and we're, uh, the next lesson begins right in the next verse, uh, which will be chapter 3, verse 1. So, I'll see you next time, and have a very happy Thanksgiving week.